the transition from Augustan London through Regency London to Victorian London, from 18th century urban village to modern city, from vile corruption to some semblance of reform, was observed by many writers, but none so memorably as by Charles Dickens. In writing this lecture, it began to occur to me that for American audiences at least, the phrase Dickens is London contains a paradox. For many of us, particularly fans of the movies or popular culture, the phrase conjures up images of incomparable charm. Christmas Eve snow in A Christmas Carol, the hustle and bustle of London streets in A Tale of Two Cities, the quaintness of the old curiosity shop. In fact, you could buy miniature reproductions of the old curiosity shop and other Dickensian locations to decorate your favorite nook. Indeed, that word Dickensian has a pleasant, if slightly eccentric and muddled connotation, doesn't it? And yet, this is not at all how British readers, Dickens' contemporaries, or Charles Dickens himself would have thought of his London, or of what he was trying to do. Dickens' London is a fetid, hardscrabble place, much closer to that painted in Sweeney Todd. It's the hard streets of Oliver Twist, the putrid squalor of the Marshalsea prison, the dark alleys and courtyards of Edwin Drood, those poor, ragged children that Scrooge snubs as the snow falls on Christmas Eve, 1843. As this implies, and as every intelligent reader knows, Dickens was not just trying to entertain or to charm. He was bent on reform. But what was he trying to reform? Did he live through the best of times or the worst of times? Dickensian London was also mid-Victorian London, and so we must begin with Britain's, and so London's place in the world by, say, 1850. Following Wellington's victory over Napoleon at Waterloo, Britain was the greatest military power in Europe. But Britain was not terribly interested in asserting itself on a continent dominated by ancient repressive monarchies, Russia, Prussia, and Austria, constantly on the verge of revolution. Rather, it was British foreign policy through the 19th century to pursue splendid isolation vis-a-vis -vis Europe and concentrate on trade and empire guaranteed by the guns of the Royal Navy. The wealth of the empire had flowed into Britain mainly through London for two centuries. Some trades had died. The slave trade was outlawed in 1807. Others came to be dominated by Liverpool or Glasgow, cotton, tobacco, for example. But most everything else flowed through London. East India tea, West Indian sugar, exports of manufactured goods to the world. Imports landed at places like the gigantic East End docks at the Isle of Dogs, Deptford. Goods were stored in huge warehouses like those of the East India Company at Blackwall. Profits flowed through London mercantile counting houses in the city. Small ones like the fictional Scrooge and Marley, and big ones like East India House, Leadenhall Street, where Charles Lamb and James and John Stuart Mill all worked as clerks at various times in their lives. Huge lots of goods were bought and sold on the change, the Royal Exchange. Their ships were insured at Lloyd's. Their firm's stocks rise and fall at the Stock Exchange, which was first established as a formal exchange in 1773 on Threadneedle Street. Now, there was nothing new in all this. What was new was where the money was going. For a century now, Britain had been undergoing an industrial revolution the gradual rise of mass manufacturing by people working in factories. At first glance, London doesn't really have much to do with this. The great factories were built in the industrial boom towns of the Midlands and the North, Birmingham, Sheffield, Leeds, and above all, Manchester. London's manufacture was small scale, paper products, precision instruments. But London played a crucial role in fostering the Industrial Revolution. First, as the great consumer of goods, London drove demand. Britain's food and fuel infrastructure had to expand to keep London fed and heated. Second, by providing crucial financing for the investment needed to found factories. You'll remember the financial revolution, well that makes possible the establishment of much of the new infrastructure of the Industrial Revolution. And third, by acting as the great port from which English manufactured goods tools and medical instruments, stoves and grates, steam engines were distributed to the rest of the world. Britain was the world's workshop. London was the funnel through which all those goods made their way. 
In 1851, Britain's wealth was put on display in London at the first World's Fair, the Crystal Palace Exhibition. The idea originated by Queen Victoria's consort, Prince Albert, was to provide a showcase for the industrial achievements of the world. But the exhibition was dominated by British manufacturers and the products of the British Empire. Thackeray called it the vastest and sublimest popular festival the world has ever witnessed. Perhaps the greatest marvel of all was the vast iron and glass building in Hyde Park that housed it, the Crystal Palace. Designed by Sir Joseph Paxton, built in prefabricated units, after the exhibition, the Crystal Palace was moved to Sydenham on the South Bank, where it unfortunately burned down in 1930. The Crystal Palace stood just a few hundred yards away from some of the worst slums in Europe, and this is the irony that confronted Charles Dickens. It is that contrast, wealthy, world capital London, and wretched, outcast London, Fagin's London, that lies at the heart of Dickens' art. Let us follow Charles Dickens himself to try to sort out this reality. Like so many Londoners, Dickens was not born there. He was born at Portsmouth in 1812, the son of John Dickens, who, like Pepys, was a clerk in the Navy office. Dickens himself arrived in London in 1822 from Chatham, Kent, in the east. He probably came via the Old Kent Road, through Deptford, then Southwark High Street, so now he's approaching from the east and then the south, across London Bridge. Unlike our previous immigrants, he probably first saw London from flat open fields south of the city. These contained market gardens to feed it, and they also contained the garbage dumps uh, that took away London's uh, uh, refuse. The scene was probably relieved vertically only by the blackened dome of St. Paul's. Over that dome hung the thickest cloud of coal smoke Dickens had ever seen, produced by thousands of chimneys. He would then have passed through the nondescript hodgepodge of coaching inns, hospitals, and prisons that comprised Southwark, before crossing London Bridge. By now, London Bridge is bereft of houses. It looks like a bridge. If sitting on the right-hand side of the coach, our precocious ten-year-old might have gawked at all the ships riding at anchor in the Pool of London. Here, the stench of the Thames was unendurable. Coach passengers would put up the windows no matter how hot the day. Old London Bridge would be torn down in 1831 and replaced by a new one. The new one is the one currently in Lake Havasu City by John Rennie. Later in his life, Dickens and his autobiographical character David Copperfield liked to go and sit here on London Bridge and watch the world go by. On a darker note, Nancy's murder and Oliver Twist takes place on the steps of London Bridge. So he crosses London Bridge, and then the coach ho horses struggle up Corn Hill. Remember, this is a city run on horsepower. We would find the stench overwhelming and the traffic paralyzing. Slowly, past uh, carts and omnibuses and streets full of people, including sandwich board men, uh, uh, hawking goods, the carriage makes its way up Fish Street, which becomes Gracechurch Street, takes a left at Lombard Street, goes past the Royal Exchange where Ebenezer Scrooge would spend his mornings and later in the book learn about his own funeral, makes its way onto Cheapside, where Master Dickens was dumped out unceremoniously at the Cross Keys, the same inn Pip arrived at in Great Expectations. Dickens never wrote down his first impressions, but he has Pip recall, I was scared by the immensity of London. I think I might have had some faint doubts whether it was not rather ugly, crooked, narrow, and dirty. The next few years of Dickens' life were spent shuttling back and forth between lower middle-class suburbs like Camden Town, north of London, where Bob Cratchit would eventually live, and Southwark. His father was a spendthrift and fell into debt and eventually the family ended up in the Marshall Sea Prison, just steps away from the Tabard Inn. This became the inspiration for Little Dorrit, who's actually born in the prison. According to an anonymous eyewitness in 1833, 170 persons have been confined at one time within these walls, making an average of more than four persons in each room, which are not ten feet square. I will leave the reader to imagine what the situation of men thus confined, particularly in the summer months, must be.
This notorious prison was finally closed by Act of Parliament in 1842. Its gate alone still stands off of Borough High Street in Southwark. Young Charles was put to work in Warren's Blacking Factory at 30 Hungerford Stairs, the present site of Charing Cross Station. He was a true member of the new industrial proletariat, which means he worked 12 hours a day wrapping bottles of shoe polish for six shillings a week. Now from this point, it's just about possible to trace young Dickens' rising fortunes geographically by crossing the bridge as he did into the city and then moving ever westward into ever more fashionable areas as his work prospered. So we're going to use this as the sort of frame device for our tour of Dickens' London. As a young man, Dickens used his free time to train himself to be a novelist. He obtained a reader's card to the British Museum at 18, where he read Shakespeare and English history. He would famously wander the streets of London when he wasn't in the museum. Up courts and down courts, in and out of little squares, peeping into counting houses, passages, and running away. Ever staring at the British merchants and never tiring of the shops, I rambled on all through the day. He learnt every street and court, markets, gardens, their character and idiosyncrasies, and of course this knowledge infuses the novels. All this, in fact, came in handy very early in his life, in the early 1830s, when he became a reporter, starting at his uncle's Mirror of Parliament. Dickens' journalistic impressions of London were collected in Sketches by Boz. Much of this period was spent in the old square mile of the financial and shopping district, what Londoners call the city. By now, the city is no longer surrounded by the old city wall. That had been completely taken down, except for the bits by the Museum of London. But otherwise, the city looked very much as it did in the 18th century. It was still dominated by the Royal Exchange on Corn Hill, which had been rebuilt after the fire. There was the new Bank of England on Threadneedle Street. This is threatened by the Gordon rioters in Barnaby Rudge. There was the Guild Hall, which sees the trial of Pickwick and Bardell. To the east, the Tower, where David Copperfield plays tourist. To the west, St. Paul's and Newgate, the latter of which figures far more uh, prominently in Dickens' work than does the church. From the late 18th century, executions no longer take place in the carnival atmosphere of Tyburn, but within this more controlled environment, in other words, within the walls of the prison. So this is the site of Fagin's final delirium and execution in Oliver Twist. The city was still arranged in narrow winding streets, even narrower alleys, and airless courts now black with soot. But it was losing its residence, in favor of shops and offices. People are moving out, and increasingly, the city is becoming entirely commercial. In Dickens' works, Ebenezer Scrooge, Paul Dombey, Martin Chuzzlewit, and Dodson and Fogg all have their establishments here within the city. Heading just a bit south and west from Newgate and St. Paul's, we reach London's main axial road along the river, our old haunts, Fleet Street and the Strand. No tour of London is complete without walking along these streets. Fleet Street is still the center of the print trade, and that mattered to young Dickens in countless ways. As a youth, in 1827, he was an office boy to a company of attorneys near Lincoln's Inn Fields to the north. Fleet Street is also the center of legal London, as you'll recall. Also to the north, 13 to 14 Portsmouth Street dates back to 1567. It's said to be the model for the old curiosity shop. So perhaps Dickens saw this on his way to work. Dickens came to know the legal district around Fleet Street, the Old Bailey, the Inns of Court, and Fleet Prison very well. Magwitch confronts Pip in the Middle Temple. Pickwick was imprisoned for debt in the Fleet Prison. Further east, near Thames Street, is Doctors' Commons. This is where the real Dickens had an office as a reporter, and the fictional David Copperfield was a clerk. Later, the offices of Dickens' own household words and all the year round were in Wellington Street, just off of the Strand. So a lot of Dickens' sort of early to middle life is concentrated in this area. In 1834-37, Dickens lived near here at Furnival's Inn, where he wrote Pickwick Papers, his first big success. Let's head west down Fleet Street, if we cross Temple Bar, still causing traffic jams until its removal in 1878, and continue up the Strand, we come on our left to Somerset House. This has sort of taken the place of a lot of the big mansions that used to be the inns that used to be on the riverside. 
old Somerset House was the palace of the Stuart Queen's consort. It was demolished in 1775. New Somerset House, designed by Sir William Chambers, is a vast government office building on the Thames. It was the Navy pay office in Dickens' day, so his father worked here. In the 20th century, it housed the Inland Revenue, the British version of the IRS, and the National Registry of Births, Marriages, and Deaths. So it was said that here, they hatched them, matched them, and dispatched them. Today, it also houses the prestigious Courthold Institute of Art. Further west along the Strand, and extending north through Covent Garden and Drury Lane to Shaftesbury Avenue, is the Theatre District, first established under Charles II. Dickens loved the theatre, and many theatres from his day survive. The Adelphi on the Strand, for example, still standing, was the site of many dramatizations of Dickens' novels. Further west in the Strand, we find a lovely Baroque church on an island in the middle of the street. This is St. Mary Le Strand, where Dickens' parents wed, and it's one of the loveliest buildings in London, one of my favorites. To our right, as we stand near St. Mary Le Strand, is Covent Garden. By the mid-19th century, all the aristocrats and most of the brothels have fled. Covent Garden has reverted back to being just a fruit market. David Copperfield buys flowers for Dora here, and Job Trotter spends a night in a vegetable basket here in Pickwick Papers. In 1847, Giuseppe Persiani bought the theater nearby, and he began to stage Italian opera. This eventually evolved into the Royal Opera House Covent Garden, famous around the world. If we divert north, up Drury Lane, we encounter a little bit of old Covent Garden, gin shops, pawnbrokers, prostitutes, and low life generally. According to Dickens, there is more filth and squalid misery near these great thoroughfares than in any part of this mighty city. Returning to the Strand, we turn left at Charing Cross, down Whitehall Street. We walk past Inigo Jones's elegant banqueting house, the only surviving part of Whitehall when it burnt down in 1698, and past the hodgepodge of houses built in the 17th and 18th centuries on the rubble, really, of the old palace. Most of these are government offices. They're going to be replaced later in the 19th century with magnificent formal ministries, which we see today. Whitehall is now quite built up and very impressive. A good example of the older style, never to be replaced, is Number 10 Downing Street. This was the house of Sir George Downing, a 17th century treasury official who left it to the crown at his death. In the 18th century, it became the traditional home of the First Lord of the Treasury, that is, the Prime Minister. So behind this nondescript frontage, a typical, comfortable 18th century house, we would encounter the labyrinthine chambers of the Treasury from whence Britain is governed. Moving on, we reach the old Westminster Palace, home of the Houses of Parliament, where Dickens worked as a reporter from 1831 to 36. This is not the Palace of Westminster you know from tourist postcards. It was still, in fact, instead, the rather dumpy medieval structure built by Edward the Confessor and donated to Parliament's use when Henry VIII acquired much finer accommodation at Whitehall. Westminster Palace was always small and cramped and inadequate. If every MP turned up, some couldn't be seated. It met its end in 1834, as so much of medieval London did, by fire. And there's a good story. The 1830s were a decade of reform in Britain, and one of the ancient institutions eliminated was the old exchequer, the Royal Accounting Office. Now, one of the exchequer's oldest continuing, continuous series of records came in the form of sticks, tallies, wooden sticks, cut with hash marks to indicate amounts of money brought in by the sheriffs, who in the Middle Ages were likely to be illiterate. It was decided, and they had amassed thousands of these over some 800 years. It was decided that the thousands of these little sticks preserved in the basement of the House of Lords had to be got rid of, that they should be burned in the furnace of the palace. And so those in charge did their jobs a little too enthusiastically. For on the 16th of October, 1834, the furnace became overwhelmed, resulting in a fire which burned down the Houses of Parliament. This actually gave the nation the chance to build an adequate and far more magnificent building. After a competition that produced 97 entries, the Gothic design by Charles Barry and Augustus Pugin won. It took over 20 years from the laying of the first foundation stone in 1837 to the completion of the Victoria Tower in 1860 for the present 
far grander Palace of Westminster to be completed. The new Palace of Westminster, with its distinctive clock tower and Big Ben's famous chime, has become a symbol of London, of Parliament, and of the nation. So I think we can agree that it was a successful design. Finally, we come to Westminster Abbey. By the 19th century, the tradition was finally and firmly established that Britain's greatest statesmen, scientists, and artists were buried here. Charles Dickens would join them in June of 1870. But in the meantime, in our lecture, he's still very much alive. And like the city itself, as he prospers, he moves west, eventually settling in the arty district of Bloomsbury. Bloomsbury lies north of Covent Garden. It's bounded by Holborn to the south, Gray's Inn Lane to the east, Tottenham Court Road to the west, and in this period, still open fields to the north. As with the Bedford estate, Bloomsbury was acquired first by the church and then confiscated by the crown. In the mid-16th century, its open fields were awarded to Thomas Rothesley, who became Earl of Southampton in 1547. It was his descendant, the fourth Earl, later Lord Treasurer of England, who began the development of the manor. In 1657, he pulled down the old manor house and built a London mansion called Southampton House, and then built Southampton Square around it. If Covent Garden was the first London square, this renamed Bloomsbury Square in the 18th century, was the first one with the word square in its title. The square soon filled in with great houses, in particular Montague House, built adjacent to Southampton House. That's important because in 1755, the second Duke of Montague sold the edifice to house the British Museum. The idea for the British Museum arose thanks to the will of Sir Hans Sloane, an eminent physician who'd spent many years and 50,000 pounds amassing a collection of scientific books, manuscripts, and specimens. At his death in 1753, he offered the collections to the nation at the discount price of just 20,000 pounds. At the same time, and Parliament immediately took advantage of this, they passed a Foundation Act which made provision for the purchase of the Harleian Collection of Manuscripts, collected by Robert Harley, Earl of Oxford, the Cottonian Library, assembled in the 17th century by Sir Robert Cotton, and the Royal Library, which was, was presented by George II. These four collections formed the nucleus for the British Museum. Funds for purchase were raised by a public subscription, and the museum was opened in Montague House in 1759. Admission was by written application to the librarian, and only small groups were admitted for guided tours until 1879. Over the years, the British Museum has acquired such treasures as the Rosetta Stone in 1801, the Elgin Marbles in 1816, innumerable Egyptian mummies, botanical collections, state papers, diaries, correspondence, newspapers, works of literature, history, science, etc. As a result, by the 1840s, Montague House was simply inadequate to hold the collections, so it was demolished in favor of the present neoclassical building. The British Museum entered a golden period. In the glorious domed main reading room could be found not only Charles Dickens, but Thomas Carlyle, Karl Marx, George Bernard Shaw, and a host of industrious scholars, including, much later, yours truly. In 1973, the British Library became a separate entity, and it moved to a separate building in 1997. Together, these two form one of the world's preeminent national collections made available to ordinary users, like myself, from around the world. Close by, at 48 Doty Street, Bloomsbury, we find the great man in middle age. The house was rented from 1837 on the proceeds from the Pickwick Papers. It was here that he wrote Oliver Twist. The house is now the Dickens House Museum. Bloomsbury continued to have literary and artistic associations well into the 20th century, culminating in the Bloomsbury Group meeting regularly between 1905 and 1941. This included the authors Virginia and Leonard Wolf, Lytton Strachey, John Maynard Keynes, and E.M. Forster. Continuing west along Oxford Street, which was built on the ancient Roman track to Oxford, we begin to encounter a series of regular squares named for the great aristocratic families that developed them. During the 17th century, the Rothsleys united in marriage with the Russells, who, already had, who were already the greatest landowners in London. This created a vast estate and an unstoppable development combination. 
We've noted how during the 18th century, the Russell property in Bloomsbury filled up with fashionable squares, often named for Russell titles, Russell Square, Bedford Square, Tavistock Square, etc. But the Russells weren't alone. Moving very roughly east-west, we encounter Soho Square, Leicester Square, which was fashionable in the 18th century, but by the 19th century, it was already becoming known for cheesy entertainment. For example, Mr. George's shooting gallery in Bleak House. Today, Leicester Square is home to garish movie theaters and pseudo-American takeaways. St. James's Square, in front of the palace, always one of London's ritziest addresses. Cavendish Square figures in several Dickens novels. Lord George Gordon, the instigator of the Gordon Riots, lived just off the square in Barnaby Rudge. The Myrtles in Little Dorrit live here. Madame Mantellini has her dressmaking shop here in Nicholas Nickleby. And Silas Wegg maintains a stall near here in Our Mutual Friend. Now the last two are important because they remind us that even the most fashionable London square had its fair share of modest inhabitants, even beggars. There were servants and shopkeepers, usually living in narrow little streets just off the squares. These were built because wealthy people needed their services. And of course, poor people congregated here because they smelled the money. In fact, here in the heart of fashionable London, we're not very far from its worst slum, the infamous Seven Dials, seven streets that converge on the perennially and infamously poor parish of St. Giles in the Fields, south of Bloomsbury at the north end of St. Martin's Lane. During the 19th century, this area was inhabited by poor Irish immigrants, known as Teagues, who did London's dirtiest jobs. Dickens wrote of the area, From the irregular square into which he, the visitor, has plunged, the streets and courts dart in all directions until they are lost in the unwholesome vapor which hangs over the housetops and renders the dirty perspective uncertain and confined. And lounging at every corner, as if they came there to take a few gasps of such fresh air as has found its way so far, are numerous, gr numerous groups who are idling about the gin shops and squabbling in the center of the road. Every post in the open space has its occupant, who leans against it for hours with listless perseverance. And yet, a few steps west would take us to Grosvenor Square and Belgravia, two of the most exclusive addresses in London. Between 1839 and his death in 1870, Dickens and his family moved around these various West End squares. In other words, by the end of his life, through sheer dint of genius and hard work, Charles Dickens had arrived. But had his work done any good? In the last lecture, we already noted numerous public health and safety reforms enacted during his lifetime. For example, the establishment of the Municipal Board of Works in 1855 and its erection of a superior sewer and drainage system, which resulted in cleaner water and fewer deaths in London. To this might be added the creation of the London County Council in 1889. The LCC was responsible for public works, slum clearance, public housing, and planning. It forms one of London's earliest attempts at a central organization that would take care of not only the city of London, but Westminster. Slum clearance was in particular a priority of this organization right up to World War II. And if you read Dickens on the slums, you know that he would have approved. Though not a major focus of Dickens's work, this period also saw the arrival of good, reliable, and cheap public transportation to and from the suburbs and within the city via omnibus service, horse cars and trams, the steam-driven underground. The Metropolitan Line between Paddington and Farringdon was opened in 1863. The District and Circle, its Circuit of London, completed by 1884, and the Northern Line begun by 1890. These wouldn't be united into one complete system until the turn of the century, just after the turn of the century, by a Chicagoan named Charles Yerkes. But all of this made it possible for future Bob Cratchits to live north in Camden Town and make it to work in the city on time. Prisons like the Marshall Sea and the Fleet were demolished, but Seven Dials and the East End remained squalid. In short, by the late 19th century, London was a magnificent and well-run imperial capital. But its extremes of poverty and wealth persisted, and it will be those extremes that we explore even further in the next lecture.